Thanks so much for being with us today. We're concluding our message series on the life of King David. Today, we're going to be looking at a reminder that probably few of us actually need, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. This is a very common phenomenon that we all experience at one time or another. Here's the first fill in the blank on your message outline. Here's our reminder. Life rarely goes as planned. Have you experienced that yet? Life rarely goes as plans. Plans are great. We all need plans. In fact, the Bible says we're foolish if we do not plan. But reality is actually greater than our plans. Isn't that true? And reality always trumps our plans. In other words, reality always wins. A couple of reasons why things don't always go the way we plan. Sometimes it's because of the decisions we make. Sometimes it's because of the decisions that other people make. But at the end of the day, sooner or later, what happens is this. Some of our dreams simply will not come true. And maybe even sadder, some of our dreams cannot come true. For some of you, the idea of living happily ever after is not going to be your reality. For some, maybe you won't walk with your daughter down that aisle one day. You'll never have need of a high chair for maybe a child or maybe a grandchild Maybe that second marriage is looking a lot like your first marriage. That prodigal son or daughter is not coming home. You're not going to get into that school that you've always dreamed of, that you've longed for. The person that you said, don't marry that person. They're going to marry him whether you like it or whether you don't. Money's always going to be tight for some. That dream job that you took is turning out it's not really the dream you thought it was going to be. Your idea of those great family celebrations at the holiday times is not going to be a reality for you. For some, you're not going to be able to have children. Oftentimes, when our dreams don't come true, there's an internal sense of either panic and or anger because maybe some of these things have been true for you. You look and you say, but God promised me. Maybe you had hooked on to some verse in Scripture and you had latched on to that. Maybe you feel God owes you. You think of all the things that I've done for God. He, he owes me. You played by the rules. You did things right. You raised them right. You behaved. You waited. Or maybe you see others, their dreams are coming true, but not your dreams. And maybe worst of all, you look around and you see that God has granted other people what you had wished for, what you had dreamed. So here's the question we have to wrestle with today. What do you do when your dreams can't come true? David is now in his 20s. When he was in his 20s, he had dreams of becoming king. God had made promises to him. Those promises were undermined by, undermined by crazy King Saul. We know that David literally had to free, flee Jerusalem for his very life. And he, off, he did what we often do as well. He panicked and he made one bad decision after another. And we looked at one incident where hundreds of people, innocent people, literally died because of David's actions. David is now the king. And as David, as king, he would actually undermine his own dreams. And he's going to leave us with a very important lesson we're going to look at today. Last week we saw that David finally became king. We're going to now skip ahead about 22 years. He became king when he was 30. He's now in his 50s. He's no longer that cute, cool kid who killed Goliath the giant. Probably by his age, he's lost some of his teeth. He's not so handsome anymore. Perhaps he even smelled bad. His army was at war, we're told. And instead of being there to lead his armies, for some unexplained reason, David had remained back in the capital of Jerusalem. He couldn't sleep one night. He's out walking on the terrace, on the roof of the palace, if you would. He looks down into a neighboring home, and he sees in the back a beautiful woman bathing. He asks one of his servants, who is that woman? The reply is, that is Uriah's wife. Uriah, your servant, one of the commanders, one of your officers in your army, sir. And David says some very ill-fated words. He simply said, get her for me. 
In 1 Samuel, rather 2 Samuel 11, 4, here's what happened. David sent some messengers to get her, Bathsheba. She came into him and he had sexual relations with her. If you were with us for the very first message in this series, you may remember that at the very beginning, God had warned the nation of Israel, you don't want a king. You need to allow me to continue to be your king because if you have a king, there's problems that come with having a king. Look at this, fill in the blank. One of those problems is this. One of the problems of having a king is that no one can tell the king no. You might be able to tell a priest no, a prophet no. Maybe you even tell the judge no, but you cannot tell the king no. Most of us are familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba. We, knows what, we know what happens. She gets pregnant. She sends words to David about this. David says, I can fix this. He sends for Uriah. Uriah comes home from the battlefield. He sends after him under the guise. He wants a report of how the war is going. After he gets the report, he says to Uriah, go home to your wife. I'll send you back to the battlefront tomorrow. But Uriah was an incredible, honorable man. He did not go home. In fact, he slept with David's servants instead of going to his own home. When David found out, he brought him in. He says, Uriah, why didn't you go home? And he looked and he said to King David, he's, he said, how, how can I go and enjoy a meal with my wife and sleep with my wife, knowing all the time my men, my commanding officers are lying out in that field waiting to go to battle the next day? David says, I want you to stay one more day and I'll send you back tomorrow. That night, he got Uriah as drunk as he could possibly get him, pointed him kind of in the direction of his home and said, now go home. But again, Uriah did not go home. He slept with David's servants again. The next morning, David wrote a letter, gave it to Uriah to give to Joab, the commander of the army. It was literally the death sentence of Uriah. In that note, David told Joab, his commander, attack the city walls of the city they were trying to conquer. and said, when you get to the walls, when the battle is the fiercest, I want you to have Uriah and his men at the very front of the, where the fiercing, fiercest fighting will take place. In the heat of the battle, I want you to retreat, leaving essentially Uriah and his men alone. That's exactly what happened. As would be expected, they all died. Word comes back, Bathsheba mourns for her husband. But David eventually sends for her, and he weds her. He marries her. There are some who would look at this and say, what a wonderful king we have. Look how he's taking care of this poor widowed woman. He's going to raise a child that's not even his but the truth of the matter was this. There were really no secrets in the palace. Those walls literally talked, if you would. And it wasn't long until the prophet Nathan was sent by God to go and confront King David regarding his sin. And when he gets to David, he tells David a story. He says there was a, a two men. There was one man who had literally hundreds and hundreds of sheep and cattle. He was very wealthy. And there was a poor man who scrimped and he saved enough to buy one little sheep. And his family loved that little lamb. They fed it from the table. The lamb drank from the cup they drank from. They, the lamb slept in the bed with them. And the rich man had a friend that came to visit him and to pre prepare a nice meal for him. Instead of slaughtering one of his own animals, he took the one little lamb from this poor family. When David heard this story, he exploded with anger and he yelled out, That man deserves to die. Nathan simply looked at him and said this to the king, You are that man. You had Uriah killed and you took his wife. You see, David had forgotten something very, very important. Something that we should remember. Whether you're a follower of Christ or not, we should all remember this. And here it is. That every sin always comes prepackaged with a consequence. Here's what Nathan said to David. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done. I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes. And he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all of Israel. And I want you to notice at the bottom of that verse, I gave you a reference to 2 Samuel 16, 22. This literally came true. It happened to David. I'll let you read it for yourself. Notice David's response in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. Here's what David said. Notice what he said. Then David said to Nathan, this is very, very powerful, I made a mistake. That's not what he said, is it? But that's what we say. How many times have you heard a politician or some movie star or some sports figure called in the very or act of adultery and they come out and say, well, I, I made a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. A mistake is something you didn't mean to do. 
David got it right when he said before God, I have sinned against the Lord. And even though David was a king, he was a very, very flawed individual. He never, though, confused himself with the king of Israel. He was a king, but not the king. That was God himself. David never abandoned God's law. He acknowledged his fault and he surrendered to God's will. So we see this happening. Nathan replied to him, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But David had to understand this, that there were going to be some unavoidable consequences for what David had done. He had murdered someone innocent who was innocent. He tried to hide it. He lied to the nation. One of the consequences that did occur when this baby was born to David and Bathsheba, the baby only lived a few days and the baby died. But God was gracious to David and Bathsheba because they conceived another son and had a son. Perhaps you've heard of him. His name was Solomon. Look at this next fill in the blank. Ten years later, ten years later, the full consequences of David's sin take hold and they turn his world upside down. And at the very end of the story, here's what we see, that David's dreams cannot come true. Amnon was the oldest of David's son. He was the next one in line to be the king when David died. But he was consumed with lust with one of his half-sisters, Tamar. They had the same paw, different maws. He is so consumed with lust for her, so desiring sexually of her, he pretends to be ill. He asks King David, his father, Would you allow Tamar to make a special meal and bring it to me as I'm sick? David said that was fine, and she did that. When she got into the room with him, he commanded all of his servants to leave. He tried to seduce his half-sister when she would not go along with it. He forced himself upon her, and she begged him. She literally begged him not to do what he was about to do, to not rape her. She even said, if you just go to our father and ask him to give me to you as your wife, he will do that. But notice what the scripture says. But Amnon refused to listen to her, Tamar. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. And then this next next verse is one of the most gut-wrenching verses, I believe, in all the Bible. Verse 15, we're told this. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, get up and get out. And Tamar's life was ruined forever. For in that culture, she would never marry. She would never have children. But again, there's no secrets in the palace. Word gets out of Amnon raping his half-sister. Word got out to David. When David heard, David was furious. But notice this, he did nothing. He did nothing. One of the reasons probably why David had lost his moral authority. Who was David to say to anyone about what they did in their personal or their private life because of what he had done with Uriah and with Bathsheba. We are told that her brother, her whole brother, Absalom, took Tamar in to live with him and his family. Absalom was David's third son. We believe that David's second son by this time had passed away because Absalom now is the second in line to become king behind Abnam. He too, though, Absalom too, does nothing. He never speaks to Amnon. He never speaks to him. For two years, things go by. But Absalom is very, very shrewd. And so he finally thinks pretty much this is water under the bridge. Everybody's kind of forgotten about it. I certainly hadn't forgotten about it. So he throws a big feast. He invites King David, his father, to come. David says, I I can't come. So he says, well, what if I invite all my brothers to come? David says, I I think that's a great idea. And so he invites everyone to this great feast. All the brothers come. He makes sure that everyone gets very good and very drunk. And then here's what happens. He had already prearranged this with his men. Absalom told his men, wait until Amnon gets drunk. Then at my signal, kill him. Kill him in front of all my family, all his brothers and sisters. And so at Absalom's signal, they murdered Amnon. His other brothers quickly fled back to Jerusalem. Absalom himself flees north into what we would refer to today as modern-day Syria. When David learns his oldest son, Amnon, has been murdered by his favorite son, Absalom, David does nothing. He does absolutely nothing. Life goes on. 
three long years pass, David begins to miss Absalom greatly. And so he invites him to come back to Jerusalem. Absalom is told he can go back and live in his home, but the king refuses to see him, even though he has invited him to move back to Jerusalem. For two years, Absalom tries to see David, but David ignores him. Absalom grows furious. My father has brought me back. It's like I'm under house arrest. My family will not speak with me. My father will not see me. And he got so fed up that he sent his servants to Joab's farm. Joab was David's chief military officer. He was in charge of David's armies, the armies of Israel. Joab often was known to be kind of a Goab to set up meetings between King David and other people. And so Absalom sends his service to Joab's farm, and guess what they do? They burn his farm down. Well, this got Joab's attention, so guess where he went? He went to Absalom's home to confront him about that. Absalom tells him about his desire to see his father, how his father will not see him, and Joab agrees to try to work something out, and he sets up a meeting. And Absalom finally goes before King David. He bows down before King David. David puts his hands on Absalom. In that culture, it was a way signifying and saying, your sins are forgiven. Our relationship has now been restored, but it wasn't. Absalom continues to be heard. And as far as we know, David never again calls for his son. The relationship between David and Absalom is not repaired. And so Absalom makes a decision. He decides to overthrow his father and to take the kingdom for, from him. But he is very, again, very shrewd man. Here was his plan. Each day he would go outside the city gates of Jerusalem. As people would come in, some he would notice were from out of town. He would engage them in conversation. And many were coming to try to get an audience with David. They had a court case, if you would, that they wanted David to resolve. The king's word was law. But many times they couldn't because David didn't have time to see everyone. And so Absalom sat outside the city gates and as people would come in, he would ask them where they're from. He would hear their stories. He would be very sympathetic. He would say, you know, you really have a strong case here. It's just too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it. You know, if, if I were a judge, I, you could come to me and I could give you justice. If they tried to bow down to him as a show of respect because now he's the next in line to become king, Absalom would stop them. He would let them bow he would actually raise him up and he would embrace him as a sign of friendship. He did this for four years. Four years. Here's what happened. Second Samuel 15, 6. Absalom behaved this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And notice what happened. He stole the hearts of the people of Israel. He was now ready to set the next stage in motion. It was a plot to overthrow David. Here's what happened. While Absalom was there in Hebron, he sent secret messengers to all the tribes of Israel to stir up a rebellion against the king. He said this, as soon as you hear the, the ram's horn, his message read, you are to say, Absalom has been crowned king in Hebron. In Hebron. This is now 16 years after the affair with Bathsheba. David's world begins to unravel before his very eyes. His first son has been murdered by his favorite son who now institutes a civil war that threatens to take everything away that David has built. Here's what happened. A messenger came after this had happened and, and, and people are saying that Absalom's the new king. A messenger came and told David, the hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, come, we must flee or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. David knew that if there was a fight in the capital city that anyone who remained in the city would be deemed by Absalom to be loyal to David and they would be slaughtered in the process. So David abandons his throne to save the city and once again he finds himself as a fugitive. He runs from his home. He runs from the very people who supposedly love him. He is now 61 years old. This is not his dream. This is not what was supposed to happen. This is not what he expected. David's dreams were not coming true. And as it would turn out, they could not come true. And this is where our life stories intersect with David. Sometimes when we look and we are heartbroken, we're disappointed, we're angry, we look for something or someone to blame. We begin to ask, where is God? What's the point? Why even try to live out my faith? God could have stopped this. God could have prevented this from happening to me. Or maybe you're sitting there saying, you know, I hung with this person for years. I hung with him. I hung with her year after year. Now look at what they've done. Where has it got me now? I waited and I waited and I was faithful. 
Maybe you look and you see a child and you said, I raised him or her right. I didn't deserve this. I don't deserve this. I deserve to be treated better than this way. Maybe you might say, you know, I was honest. I was always told if I'm honest that God would bless that. He would honor that. I was honest and I lost my job because of it. I got fired. Or maybe you worked really, really hard and it just simply hasn't worked out. It's during these times that often we take things into our own hands. We make matters worse. We compound the problem. Sometimes we're so hurt. We're so angry. We're so disappointed even with God. We hurt ourselves We create more regret. We create sometimes even more debt. We take more painkillers, but the pain is still there. This was not the first time David had been in a situation like this. You will remember, if you've been with us again for the whole series, how David had fled the kingdom once before. He had taken matters into his own hands. It did not turn out very well. And fortunately, David had learned something along the way from that incident. This is actually the life lesson we want to look at from David today. Here's what the story goes on. It said, The whole countryside wept aloud as the people passed, as David and those who were with him passed by, the people wept. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley, and all the people moved on towards the wilderness. Zadok, a priest, was there too with all the Levites, who were also priests, who were with him, and they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Now, this is very important. It's easy for us just to read this and and just skim right over it and miss a big point. Notice this, fill in. The Ark of the Covenant represents the very presence of God for the ancient Israelites. In other words, you could not be closer to God than to be in the presence of the Ark. It was almost like a, a good luck charm, if you would. They would carry the Ark of the Covenant in battle. They would win the battle. But as this is all happening, David is, is just not right in his heart. And here's what David says. The king said to Zadok, take the Ark of the Covenant back into the city. And I guarantee you when he said that, the people moaned a deep moan. Because that Ark not only gave them courage because they were following the king, they were also following the very presence of God. And I'm sure they felt like it's almost like David was saying that they were in the wrong and Absalom was actually in the right. But listen to his explanation. It's very powerful. David goes on and he says this. If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and he will let me see it, referring to the ark and his dwelling place again. David is saying, I will not try and manipulate God. And then he goes on and he says this, but if God says, I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good. Here's what David was saying. I fill in the blank for you. David was simply saying, God's will, not mine. Thy will be done, God. Your will be done, not my will. Because David, as he would reflect, would probably say this. Every time I did my will, I messed things up. I made things worse. I got in my own way. David lost his world at this point. His world was totally upside down. But notice this. He did not, he did not lose his confidence in God. David chose a deliberate decision. He chose not to abandon God when it appeared that God had chosen to abandon him. Things were not going David's way. David said, though, I am not going to go to war with my son. I am not going to risk the city. This is not about me. God put me in place as king, and it is God's will to choose when, where, and how he chooses to remove me. So he leaves the ark And he leaves the city as well. Absalom enters Jerusalem and the palace. He takes it without any resistance whatsoever. But it's a hollow victory for Absalom because he will not be the undisputed king until David is killed. So he tries to begin to figure out what to do. There were two trusted advisors of David. One was a gentleman by the name of Ahithophel. The other was a gentleman by the name of Hushai. Ahithophel had stayed in the palace And he flip-flopped his allegiance from David to the new incoming king, Absalom. And he says to him, how can I serve you as I served your father, David? What can I do for you? And Absalom says, I'm trying to figure out what should I do. And here was Ahithophel's advice to him. He says, don't rest. Immediately go after David now. Don't let him get organized. Don't let him gather more troops. They're kind of all scrambling now to, to get things together. If you go after him now, you can catch him and you can kill him. The other advisor, Hushai, actually left Jerusalem with David. But when David realized that Ahithophel was still left, 
in the palace and he would give good advice to Absalom, he asked Hushai to go back and to give the opposite advice, if you would, frustrate the advice that Ahithophel would give. So he did. So here's what Hushai replied to Absalom when he was asked what he would consider doing. He said, the advice Ahithophel has given is not good this time. You know your father and his men, they're fighters, and as fierce as a wild bear robbed of her cubs. Besides, your father is an experienced fighter. He's not going to spend the night with the troops. Even now, he's hidden in a cave or some other place. So his advice was, don't rush. No, take your time. Don't listen to Ahithophel. Consolidate your troops. Gather a larger army. Then you can personally lead them and overthrow your father. He goes on and he says, if he, referring to King David, if he should attack your troops first, whoever hears about it will say this, there has been a slaughter among the troops who follow Absalom and people will not follow you. And Absalom fortunately bought into what Hushai had said. He waited Ahithophel knew this, that if David was given time to organize and gather an army, that he would not be defeated in open combat. The scripture says that Ahithophel was so dis- discouraged, so depressed by this, he went home, he took his own life. David hears sometimes later now that Absalom is finally coming. He must defend himself, but he does the smart thing. He divides his army into three different sections, each with their own separate commander. He gives his his officers, this command, he was very clear about it. The king commanded, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. In other words, when you capture him, if you capture him alive, don't kill him. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom each of his, to each of his commanders. And we're told this, then the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. This was very strategic part of, on David and his men because they knew not fighting in the open plains gave them an advantage. It was no longer about who had the superior numbers. It was more important fighting in the forest for organization and communication and experience. And David's men were better organized to fight under these conditions. They had three commanders, whereas the army of Israel looked solely to Absalom for leaderships. We're told that there... Israel's troops were routed by David's men, and the casualties that day were great. 20,000 men lost their lives. Absalom, during the battle, was caught. Here's what happens. So he, Joab, the commander of David's army, took three javelins in his hands, and he plunged them into Absalom's heart. When the army of Israel heard that Absalom had been killed, they were simply told they went home. David mourns the death of Absalom to such a degree that his soldiers are even afraid to celebrate their victory. Joab has to go to David and said, you need to shake up and you need to go out there and celebrate with your men. They think that you would rather see them dead and Absalom alive than the other way around. David returns to Jerusalem as a king, but his world is never the same. He dies nine years later at the age of 70. The very fact that the biographers, those who wrote these accounts, did not hide David's faults, his failures, or his flaws speaks to the authenticity of this account. Even with all his flaws, David never lost his confidence in God. Even if things did go his way or they didn't go his way, even if it was his fault or someone else's fault, David's ending reminds us of something incredibly important, especially when our dreams don't come true. It's this, that the foundation of our faith is not answered prayer. It is not happily ever after endings. It's not these things. It's not, in other words, our faith is not to be built upon our circumstances. It is always a mistake to wrap our faith in God around the fulfillment of our dreams or even the answers to our prayers. Because here's what happens. When our dreams come true, what do we say? Oh, God is so good. God is so real and alive to me. But what do we say when our dreams don't come true? We look around and we pretty much say this. There is no God. There is no God. We have to understand that dreams that don't come true and prayers that don't get answered, they say absolutely nothing. They say nothing about the presence or the goodness or the faithfulness of our God. 
They say nothing about God's presence or his lack of activity in our life. David would be quick to remind us of this next fill in. When you and I feel forsaken, we have to realize this. We are mistaken. When circumstances don't go our way, when our dreams cannot come true, we assume from the circumstances that God is not real or God is not present. David would say to us, don't make that mistake. Don't make that mistake. Because of all the highs and lows that I experienced in my life, all the ups and downs, here's one thing I can say to you. God was always there. Perhaps David's greatest lesson that he learned is our last fill-in. David realized it wasn't about his will. It was about God's will done God's way and in God's time. I think we should join in with David and we should also say, as he wrote in Psalm 25, verse 1 and 5, he simply said this, In you, Lord my God, I put my trust, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long, even, even when my dreams don't come true. I want you to look at a couple of things I'm asking you to consider as a result of our time today. First of all, Maybe you would say this, I will not make the mistake of putting my faith in God around the fulfillment of my dreams or the answers to my prayers. I'm not going to base my faith on my circumstances. Maybe for some of you, you would have to say this, I have a dream that's died, but I will still put my faith and my confidence in God. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for these last several weeks that we've been able to look at the incredible life of David. We thank you, Father, that you have preserved for us not just the good times, but the dark times as well in his life. And you've given us principles that we can apply to our lives thousands of years later that will help us in getting through day-to-day -day life, especially, God, when some of our dreams don't come true. And for those who are listening today, that they would have to look and see in their own lives a dream that maybe has died or is on the verge of death. I pray, Father, that they would learn the lesson from David and not to put their trust in you based on circumstances, not based on answered prayers or what they seem to see your activity of dreams coming true in their life. Father, thank you that you are always there with us. You're not a good time, God. You are a 24-7 God for us. And thank you that you are there walking through those dark times with us, God. And I would pray too for someone, maybe that they truly have had a dream die, that they would realize, Father, that where one dream dies, God, Father, you open up new avenues of growth, new avenues of ministry, new avenues of meaning and purpose for us. Help us to take refuge, Father, in you during those dark times. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you so much for being with us during the series and just want to remind you also, church family, don't forget this next Sunday is the 4th of July. And don't forget, come and we're going to have a great picnic after our service here at New Hope. We want to make sure you're a part of that.